Hello, this is Ilana Levin, and this is Graphic Policy Radio. I'm beginning a roundtable conversation about a topic of supreme importance to anyone who loves comics or wishes they could still love comics. We're going to discuss sexist abuse and harassment in the comics industry, as well as its intersections with racism and ableism and transphobia and other forms of systemic oppression. Today, I'm joined by three amazing comics professionals who've done a lot of work in the crisis over the years, and I'll be introducing them in a moment. But for some context, Here's an example of the sort of stuff I'm talking about. Um, Graphic Policy, the comics news website my podcast is affiliated with, uh, they've carried plenty of reporting on the harassment in the industry over the years. Like back in 2015, Janelle Anselin wrote an article called Enough is Enough, Dark Horse's Scott Alley's Assaulting Behavior about how Dark Horse's editor, uh, an editor at Dark Horse, Scott Alley, was literally assaulting people. Um, and yet Ali continued to get work on the down low from Dark Horse, even after they said they would stop uh, stop having him work for them. In fact, it was only this past month that Dark Horse said they would actually stop working with him. And frankly, I don't even believe them now, right? Um, you know, all the while this is happening, the head of Dark Horse Comics himself was running a transphobic workplace with an expressly transphobic healthcare policy. And look, he's still there, Right. But ultimately, this isn't about Scott Alley or any one person. This is a problem with a, about a system that enables him and those like him. And a system is a harder thing to solve. And a lot of the time, the conversation has ended up being focused on individuals and what individuals have done. And that's important for accountability, but it's also not the only thing. Um, and it can sometimes focusing on specific people can keep us from like figuring out what is a broader strategy for addressing it. And looking at the ways that this harm affects everyone across the board uh, and not just the specific names associated with that story. And so I I wanted to think this out with folks who had been like living and thinking and breathing this uh, in a way that I haven't since I don't literally work in the industry. And joining me tonight are some of the smartest folks I know who've dealt with that system. We're going to talk about what the industry looks like today, what meaningful change could look like and how to break out of this seemingly endless cycle of abuse and pain. Anyway, that's just me speaking here as Ilana, and my guests will certainly be joining us with their own thoughts. Joining me is Jay Edidin. Jay writes comics, short fiction, and narrative nonfiction, covers culture, arts, science, and gender as a journalist and essayist, edits comics, transmedia, and genre fiction, and is marginally internet famous as half of the podcast Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men, which obviously you guys all listen to, as I do. Jay was named comicbooks.com's 2017 Comics Person of the Year for his investigative coverage of harassment issues at DC Comics and his work to foster diversity and inclusion in comics culture. In addition to covering harassment and abuse issues in in pop culture industries as a journalist, Jay was co-founder of the Convention Anti-Harassment Project, spearheaded the public campaign for trans-inclusive healthcare at Dark Horse Comics, and writes and consults on codes of conduct and harassment policies for companies and conventions. Welcome back to the show, Jay. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be back. Yeah, this will definitely be different than our last conversation, which is about Punisher Season 2. Um, also joining me today uh, is, a, is Joan Hilty. Joan Hilty is a comics editor who came up in the 90s queer comic scene as a cartoonist, then had a 15-year editorial run at DC Comics slash Vertigo, and now works with many of the top 10 comics publishers in licensed publishing at Nickelodeon. She's taught at Maryland Institute College of the Arts and is currently on the cartooning faculty at School of Visual Arts. She also co-chairs comics programming for the Brooklyn Book Festival and Miami Book Fair and was a longtime judge for the Dwayne McDuffie Award for Diversity in Comics. In 2014, she wrote about her experience with harassment in the industry for The Guardian, which was later part of Jay's BuzzFeed reporting on the ouster of a top editor at DC. Welcome to the show, Joan. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you on the show for the first time. I've been an admirer of your work for a long time. And also joining me is Kwanzaa Osegefo, Kwanzaa is author and creator of Black, a comic that asks, what if only Black people had superpowers? And in fact, he was on my podcast a number of years ago to talk about it, which you should totally check out. Kwanzaa has been part of the comics community for nearly 20 years, uh, beginning his career as an online producer at Marvel before moving into other media roles. He later returned to comics and launched DC Comics Digital Publishing Initiatives. In addition to creating his own properties, Kwanzaa is also a creative architect of the H1 Comics line from the French publisher 
Humanoids, co-writing their flagship title, Ignited, with comics legend Mark Wade. Welcome back, Kwanzaa. Thank you for having me. So one of the things that a lot of my friends who, uh, I would just say just generally speaking, like people who care about comics but who don't really work in the space have been asking are what are things that readers can do to better support those who've experienced abuse in the comics industry? Um, God, I feel like that's a really complicated question because it's something that is likely going to be incredibly case-specific. The first thing I'd recommend is getting as informed as possible, because the extent to which I think a lot of really, really well-intended public campaigns can can do harm in an industry that's essentially a small town is, is, is pretty great. Um, so focusing on the people who've been impacted, on what they need, on specifically what they're looking for. I mean, the first thing to do and the first thing place to look is for things like Patreons and ways to support individual creators or individual professionals outside of structures while you're still sort of navigating that territory. Yeah. And, you know, I would uh, take what Jace just said one step further and say, actually, there's a hard way and an easy way, and you can do both. Um, The more challenging way is, as Jay was just saying, to educate yourself, to really do the work of going out there and seeing what the issues are and seeing what the dialogue is. The easy way is voting with your pocketbook. The easy way is voting with your wallet. If you're a reader, you're a consumer. Buy the books of these people who need to be heard, who have been marginalized, um, who are speaking out, who are doing great work. It's consumerism. It's active consumerism. That's actually the easiest way to go about it. There's a whole spectrum of things you can do. People should understand that. I want to add, though, that if you're voting with dollars, it's really important to make sure that the publisher knows why. Because it's it's really, I, I know from experience, from sitting in costing meetings, from sitting in editorial departments, and, and I'm sure everyone else here has had that experience too, of, of having a pretty clear sense of why something has shifted and having, having other people be like, no, it's just regular attrition. Or, well, yeah, or, or come, come up with other reasons. Like, voting with your dollars works as long as you make it clear that there's a specific ballot that you're you're voting on and, and what issues are informing it. But I, I think you have to, there has to be at least some degree of, of deliberate communication about that for it to That's actually true. have policy impact. Because like, for example, if you stop reading, if there was, if Cameron Stewart was still working on Batgirl, which he isn't, and people stopped reading it because they were upset about that, for all we know, DC could decide that people weren't reading it because they don't want to read about superhero wins. I, I generally hold that if there's anything that could possibly be taken the wrong way, a company will take it the wrong way. So <laughs> in terms of communicating that, like, I mean, would you say that folks should write to the, the publisher to let them know why they're discontinuing it or? Yeah, I would say write to the publisher. Um, do it as civilly as possible. Because that's, and I think that's something that we're probably going to end up getting to later is is the specific ways that the industry is kind of primed and stacked against accountability in in ways that are a lot of in that, that have grown out of a lot of a very justified defensiveness on other fronts. Um, so, just basically communicating clearly where you are that you're making that decision, um, and pretty much leaving it at that is going to be the, the clearest and best way to do that. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up like systems because that's a lot of the way that I look at it too in terms of like visibility and people actually being aware, you know, that there are creators who they might be interested in or who need their support because we kind of operate in a system, you know, no dissimilar to any other like entertainment or media system where, you know, the two major publishers are essentially like the sun and the moon. And unless you're an astronomer who's going out and looking at the stars every night, you know, you might not be aware of all these other fantastic constellations and things out there for you to like enjoy. So yes, it's definitely, you know, on part of the consumer to be a bit more educated, but we also have to consider the fact that like there's, you know, this this system in which, you know, we're competing with bigger agencies that can really like put out a lot of content that's like, I don't, I mean, it's a competitive market, but it's almost like it, it's kind of fixing the system a bit. Because if, you know, a store or retail has to make a choice between like some like giant IP and your little like awesome indie book, you know, and there's like an event with like 16 variant covers, <laughs> that's actually going to have an impact on your on, on your book's visibility or your book even being ordered. 
So, I mean, there, there's a lot of things in place where it's like, if you really are passionate or you really love something, you know, you need to like kind of stand behind it. But the good thing is, is we all live in kind of a, you know, online world now where you can, you know, buy that stuff directly or buy it through, you know, the publisher direct, like directly or, you know, even Amazon <laughs> you can buy it from there as well. Much as it pains us indeed. Um, you know, one of the big impetuses of this conversation happening now is the group of over 60 people who came together to launch the website, so many of us.com, on which is in response to uh, the story of the stories of um, Warren Ellis um, expl- abusing his power in the comics industry. Um, let me actually read their words to you. Uh, we are a group, and this is this is from their website. We are a group of over 60 women and non-binary individuals whose utmost concern is the safety and protection of others like us. Our aim is to dismantle the systems that allow people in power to abuse that power um, for the purpose of serial predatory corralling, emotional manipulation, and grooming. With this goal in mind, we are sharing our stories about a man who abused his power. This statement was written with the involvement of all who have signed it. Warren Ellis, a New York Times best-selling author, comics writer, public speaker, screenwriter, and producer, has devised and continues to follow a pattern of emotionally abusive behavior documented across more than two decades. From our accounts and others who have come forward, there is a clear evidence of Warren Ellis using his celebrity status and vast public platform as catalyst and shield to manipulate and groom targets under false pretenses and to coerce private pornography and sexual exchanges. Over 20 years from presenting people often between the ages of 19 and 26, were impacted by this pathological behavior. And and the story continues on the site. Um, And what's also noteworthy is that the the site includes the individual stories of all of these folks, as well as this group collective statement. Um, And that felt like something new to me. And it seemed different than some of the approaches I'd seen to folks speaking out about harassment they experienced before. Uh, Do folks, do folks want to weigh in on, on what, uh, how this, uh, how this felt when you saw it or thoughts on this particular approach? Uh, yeah. Um, I, th- I think with this one, it felt like it was long overdue because I think a lot of us who have worked in this industry for any length of time have been aware or spoken up in, you know, different, in different sections of, you know, the comic book industry, but it was never really sort of, documented in this way to show that this is a pattern this is systemic and it's not just like an outlier because very often Mm -hmm. you would either hear about these things or know about these things and it would be passed off or like thought of just like oh that's a bad incident but once you started connecting those dots together you you see that like no this is something this person does and we have a system that's just like comics is just kind of primed for that sort of thing and i'm sure we'll talk about that as well but like in short, like I, I just felt like, wow, that's it's really great that this exists because people tend to brush it off when it's like the individual and not like, you know, a group speaking out. Jay? I think one of the things that the stories on the site do is illustrate a pattern that, as Kwanzaa said, would have been shouldn't have been, but would have been way too easy to dismiss as individual cases. Um, I sat down and read through all of them. And one of the things that really struck me was how incredibly parallel they were. How much the same language was coming up, how much the, the same chronologies were coming up. And it's really easy, I think, for, especially in, in, in small communities, to excuse someone's behavior and say, oh, you know, he's just awkward. Oh, he just doesn't get this. Hmm. As these, as you read more and more of those, it becomes clearer and clearer that this is someone with a set strategy and progression. That this isn't someone who made a mistake and then caught it. This is someone who did the same thing over and over and over and over again for decades. And I think it's it's how we respond as a community to that stuff. Like, I think all of us want to think that we would say something or do something. But the truth is, when you bring this stuff up with someone, I mean, I, I remember having conversations where I'd, I'd talk to someone about, you know, that general flavor of behavior in comics, and they'd be like, well, they're not doing anything illegal. Ugh. Or, 
You know, it's not someone they're working with directly. And so while with, you know, with Ali, with Berganza, you can, you can point to incidents and you can say, okay, that's assault. That's much harder to do with Ellis. And those situations fall much, much more into an area that I feel like <laughs> this is, this is the big, you know, this is where the structural problems get big, that we as a patriarchal society are much more likely to excuse away. Mm-hmm. And the repetition, I think, is striking or should be striking even to folks who are, are cy- cynically primed to dismiss individual is- incidents or to say consenting adults, even when that's really, really not the issue in a situation that's largely about abuse of, of wildly unequal power. Yeah. And so, so the individual stories, I think, do that in ways that even a collective statement with 60 signatures wouldn't. They really make it impossible to ignore that. There's also a real, I, I think this is a really powerful step forward in the Me Too era as to how individual stories are presented in a way such as to stoke collective action, you know, uh, when Harvey Weinstein's uh, behavior over decades was first coming out, and it it came out that there was something called the list. I think it was called that was just passed along around among women in the industry, and complained about as an instrument of slander because it was just a list of names. But it still told people that they were not alone. It still told people that what had happened to them had happened to other people, and that it was wrong because it was not only abusive, it was affecting careers. And what is different about these lists is that they present individual stories as a collective statement. They point to how the instances happened over and over again. They're very well organized in that sense, right? They, they say, you know, he does X, Y, and Z, and here's how it happened to one, two, three, four, and five, so that there's a collective rhythm and the scope of the problem is established very clearly. And that gives this site um, the uh, authority to say, and here's the three things that we want to happen. I think, I think it's a big step forward. After the Cameron Stort story broke uh, and Warren Ellis story began to come to light, some cis men uh, started a circulating a pledge um, about stopping abuse in the comics industry. It it launched as a graphic on Twitter. And, you know, I saw a lot of men sharing it who were like, you know, I I first started hearing it from, from, from men in the industry whose work I really respect, but most of the experts I know are, you know, were critical of both the content of the pledge as well as the pledges approach. I'd I'd love folks to speak to that. And I can link to it in the uh, comments of the, of this episode so folks can see what we're talking about if you didn't happen to come upon it on Twitter when that was coming around? Yeah, um, I'll talk to that a, a bit. I mean, I, I, I have said, and anybody who knows me knows that Cameron was a good friend of mine um, in the past, and it was really hard to see something like that come, come out, but also recognize things that maybe I saw but didn't see because, I mean, the, I feel like sometimes that's how comics trains us as an industry, you know, where that's one of the things we're speaking to. Um, and I think in that same vein, it created a, a, a space for that, that sort of graphic to be done through a very myopic singular lens, you know, uh, as to like how men would address the situation or how they would, you know, try to be better. And there, there's that part of you that wants to be a bit like forgiving and say like, well, you're trying. But at the same time, you're saying, but this, this isn't, this isn't the solution to this, you know, and by you making this declaration, it becomes more uh, about you and about like what you want to say versus like what you want to hear and what you want to accept. And that was kind of like what made it, you know, you know, kind of a wet fart (laughs) of a a campaign or whatever it was. And, and And I think we need to like really and, and a lot of this stuff is like come to terms with like what's being put out there and what's what's happening. I mean, I think that I, I guess I would disagree a little bit with that characterization. I don't think it's entirely useless. I think it's a fine first step. It's reasonably granular in 
getting people to say on the record that they will not groom, um, that they will actively intervene, um, that they will call out people. Um, but you can say all that, then you have to act, right? And there's in the thread that I think, you know, you're going to post after this, the, the Twitter thread has some very thoughtful dissection of the pledge and challenging of the pledge from Jay, from Cheryl Lynn Eaton, saying, this is okay for starters, but you got to keep going. This is not enough. One of the things that Jay brought to the conversation also was the way the initial wording of the pledge really, you know, erased the experiences of people who had dealt with abuse who weren't women. Um, and I, my, my next question was really going to be about, like, how can we make sure that the abuse of people who aren't women, you know, whether it's uh, Black men who are exp- experiencing abuse, people with disabilities who are experiencing abuse, you know, trans men who are experiencing abuse, how can we make sure that folks who aren't women, especially folks who aren't white women, aren't ignored in the conversation? So I think the first answer to that is that we as an, I mean, we as a culture, but we as an industry need to be much, much, much more aware of internal power dynamics. The extent to which I think comics is populated by people who see themselves as outsiders is part of the problem here. I mean, it's it's part of what makes us really tight-knit, but it also means that if you tell someone that, that you know, you're in a position of relative power, relative centrality, they'll be like, no, I'm not. I'm not one of the cool kids. When they absolutely have the relative power there. I mean, I think I think that's part of it. I think another part is just just conversation and listening. There's part of my problem with that statement is that it was made very fast. It was I think it's pretty facile. I think it's, um, I mean, I, I absolutely appreciate the intentions behind it, but the language in it, um, especially around gender and the absolute absence of language in it around race and disability are pretty striking omissions. And they're omissions that I think on a statement like that are really dangerous because it presents itself as, you know, the pledge. And as, as, you know, as, as Kwanzaa said, it it makes it really easy to feel like you're doing something. You're making an absolute statement. You're saying all the things that need to be said by, you know, just retweeting this graphic and you're not, there's stuff that's missing, you know, even within that. The other thing that it does, that things like this do is create an incredibly easy basically camouflage a set of camouflage for predators it's something that i there's there's no system for accountability around it first of all which you know it's 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 twitter you can you can you know tweet a i pledge this this is going to be cool that's that's fine but there's not there's there's no again there's there's really no system for accountability and some of those statements are general enough that they're not not clear enough. So going back to to gender and to marginalized marginalized, ugh, marginalized populations in general. I think going about writing this stuff and going about popularizing it has to be a much 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 more collective work than that pledge was. Um I think it's it's got to be approached the same way that collective bargaining would be and with the same kind of a quorum. Um, My specific issue with it is one that I will acknowledge is a fairly narrow issue, or the ways that it it impacts me specifically are are really specific to my situation, that I'm a trans man who, during the time that I was working at Dark Horse Comics, directly under Scott Alley, was not yet out as trans. So was, was, you know, was was presenting as and read entirely as female. And a lot of the dialogue around harassment and abuse and around gendered harassment and abuse specifically in comics completely and explicitly omits any possibility of that kind of situation or dynamic. Which is frustrating and it's especially frustrating 
as someone whose career was largely defined by that kind of dynamic and whose the the scope of whose career was also defined pretty pretty significantly by that. Joan? I mean, it's interesting when we talk about a system of accountability, what would that look like? Since we're talking about um, laying out some principles and we're talking about how people would uh, show that they are living those principles on, you know, a day-to-day basis. Um, Jay, I guess that's, that's what I'm curious about what you just said. Like, I agree. A Twitter pledge is just that it's a Twitter pledge. How do we combine the, um, way that these crowdsource documents have created uh, a voice and a way to testify with the pledge that, that at least puts some principles out of acting and, and make them work together. You know, how do we make people, how do we make people testify, you know, how do we get people to testify, not just about what they've been through, but what they are doing to make sure that nobody has to go through this, how they stopped it, how they made sure it would not happen to begin with. Oh, this is my favorite question. I think in some respect, it's almost like an, it's like, let's bring back the comics code and update it to a comics code of conduct. You know? I mean, let's not even call it parallel to the comics code, though, because it's not. We're not talking about censorship. It, it is. It's a code of conduct. Let's look at the ways that conventions have implemented harassment policies. What has and mm. hasn't worked, you know. And so, with a harassment policy, what you're basically doing is being clear about the categories of behavior that are that aren't permitted. You are, you know, giving some examples of what constitutes that behavior. You are giving people a direct course of action. And specific recourse if they experience that or if they witness it. And in theory, you're training your staff to handle that um, productively. So that's that's really context-specific. In, in comics, what you'd want, I mean, what you'd want is, is a code of conduct. It's something where you'd say, you know, these are things that I will not do. These are things that I will specifically do. These are specific steps. These are specific avenues of education. You know, if I'm signing this, I am committing to doing these things or saying that I've, you know, committing that I've done these things. Um, I think, honestly, like it's it's like a job description. It's it's like any kind of it's it, it's like a lease. It's like any kind of document that defines parameters of any kind of contract, of any kind of situation, of any kind of relationship. And I don't think I don't think that would be that would be terribly hard to come up with. What would be difficult would be doing it in a broad, thorough, and decentralized enough way to get really significant footing and, and signi- um, in, in a really decentralized industry or one that's, that's largely concentrated in two publishers, but also this massive, massive, massive network of largely freelance creators um, who don't really have any kind of guild or union that would, would normally be more involved in this stuff. So there's that. I mean, I think the second thing that goes with that is looking at it as a professional and labor issue, not just, not just a, a social, con- a social compact issue or a creepy personal behavior issue, but an issue that intersects with people's careers and with people's working environments. And we're capable of doing pretty decent sexual harassment and, and, you know, power dynamic and abuse training in employment situations. Those, those systems exist. Some of them, suck and are outdated, but some of them are really good. And finding ways to make those accessible, finding ways to make them mandatory, and finding ways to get the people who are in, the, in positions to to really promulgate them to do that is, I think, going to be critical here. And it's interesting because, you know, everybody says stuff like, well, you know, like having a union doesn't mean that discrimination is going to be over because unions have discrimination and systems of oppression in them too. I'm like, yes, this is all true. However, my friends have actually gotten people who there were their bosses who were abusive to them fired. And that has only happened to friends of mine who were members of unions or worked for unions. So it's like, no, it is not like a, it's not like a magical pill or anything, but 
Lord knows it has a better track record than anything else I've seen. And like, there's also just like the idea of something which is going to make people understand that they are, it's not about just like competing against other people that you're actually all in this together. Um, Well, and presenting it as a labor issue because it is one. When you look at the Warren Ellis stories, when you get, look at a lot of the stories within the industry, you know, the Cameron Stewart stories, a lot of them are specifically about taking and abusing a position as someone with professional power, as someone with the power to get people hired. And, and younger and vulnerable folks approaching that relationship as a professional relationship and then having the person in the position of power suddenly suddenly shift its terms and turn it personal. And... That's that's a labor issue. I mean, this is, again, I'll, I'll go back to Dark Horse and say there is an entire generation of up-and-coming editorial talent, of, of, of people who are hired at Dark Horse as young women who are now out of the comics industry, um, who are working in other industries, who I, I think there's one person who's working in another comics publisher, but for the most part, we're elsewhere because... And and no one's really ever going to know what comics would have looked like without those folks gone. You know, no one's no one's going to know what DC looks like if if Liz Marsham were in a position to had had been, had hadn't been put to the side and ended up in a position where she could acquire books and run lines. No one is going to see that. And what that means is that functionally, professional advancement is stunted or cut off, and professional options are stunted and cut off. And those are terms as concrete and basically explicit as anything in a contract right now. And and we like it's there's there are you know so, and it obviously like it 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 happens more and more along and intersecting you know other other lines of discrimination. But I think again like we can't stop looking at at it as a labor issue because. It is, and it's so important. I'm sorry. I'm gonna just. I yeah. realize I'm just sort of no, saying this over it. and over it's again. Totally I just. It, no, it just seems so. It's so central to everything about how I understand this. And one of the things that's like key in that is like part of that pattern that's like described on a site is like all of these young people who are looking for mentorship because so much of our industry is built on relationship. That's something that has to be like protected. That's something that has to like have some level of like structure or code of conduct to it, because that is how you learn about the industry, like how things how things work. But it's also how you again like build those relationships with like the next person you're going to collaborate with on something, you know? Because our industry is not like singular for all of us. Like not it, we work with people, you know. We build relationships with people in order to produce art. And those like relationships are important. So when people are seeking that and then having that trust abused, that's a problem. Joan, go ahead. I also want to go back to the topic of unionization in respect to this and say that that is going to start to happen. And there have been a lot of defeatist conversations about unionizing this industry, right? There have been a lot of dead end conversations. There were efforts made in the 70s and 80s. They didn't go anywhere. But this was also a completely different industry. It was much more disconnected from the rest of entertainment culture, especially unionized entertainment culture than it is now. It's much closer to those forms. Um, It's uh, increasingly a much more diverse population. And I you know, as you know, Elena, we, we've had many conversations about this. I think that there is going to be unionization eventually. I'm not sure that it's going to be a union. I think you are going to start to see unionizing around the edges, filling in the conversation, bolstering people. If you look at the examples of, say, um, the Animation Guild, uh, ousting um, Chris Savino, because he belonged to the animation guild and all these women belong to the animation guild and they were able to make the union adhere to the rules. If you look at the unionization of adjunct faculty at art schools, um, where they demand certain standards of treatment for the largely vulnerable adjunct faculty population, which is analogous to the freelance talent that they are teaching to go out in the world and defend themselves you are going to see, yeah, I, I think we are seeing that foundation building now. So I, I never thought it was going to be one union. That's that's sort of what I've 
that's sort of what I've come to realize. It's going to be a lot of different um, efforts that are going to knit together. Yeah, agreed. And if, if, if nothing else, I mean, the obvious obvious break is that this is something that both freelancers and publishing professionals very much need and that they very much need to have as separate entities if they do. I mean, we also just, you have more, yeah, exactly. You have more people who are now union writers because they're working in television. And, you know, I'd regularly see comics writers whose work I love with the, like the, when, when the union, uh, when Writers Guild West was dealing with the contract and negotiations with agents, Hollywood agents, they'd have these like, you know, union logos as their, uh, as their photos on Twitter. And I was like, are we organizing the labor union for the comics? No, no, this is for their job in television. But, but like once somebody isn't a member, a member of a union for some of their work and they see the difference that it makes in their lives. Cause remember, you know, working in the TV industry is full of quote unquote freelancers too. Right. Like it's, you can sort of see how this might be more applicable to you as someone in the comics industry, when you see how it works in television and other areas where you might be working. Well, that's exactly it. You know, the, the, there is more and more overlap now between comics and TV, between comics and Mm -hmm. gaming, between comics and film, between comics and all these other industries that, yeah, still have their own labor problems, but also are much more commonly unionized. And you can't put that genie back in the bottle. Once those people have worked in those other industries are like, Hey, you know, this should work both ways. And I would just say, if anybody listening to this is working in the industry and you want to talk about union stuff, you could totally come to me. I am not employed by a labor union right now, so I am able to speak about how different unions are working and stuff like that. I'm always happy to have a con- a confidential conversation. Um, actually, Joan, you just hit on something about the uh, about education. Um, you, you've been talking a bit about uh, the situation with the School for the Visual Arts. And um, the School for Visual Arts, for those who don't know, is it's, it's famous co- you know, school for teaching generations of comics and animation students how to, how to work, how to draw, how to make stories, and has recently been rocked by stories of horrific abuse by professors. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you, Joan, because you're not only someone who's been thinking about what the situation looks like there, but how that sort of sets a tone for the industry in general. Yeah, and I can't, I just want to say, I can't speak to it too directly, having not been directly involved, but I've been really struck by how long there have been problems going on and how quickly things came to a head in this last month. Um, There is an article uh, for folks who are interested on a cartoon brew that ran on June 29th that described not just a uh, situation at SVA, but at uh, Maryland Institute College of Art, where I've also worked in the past, um, where uh, three prominent anima- animation animators, illustrators um, who worked as educators, um, had and had been accused of patterns of harassment and abuse over time, um, finally lost their jobs. And that article does not even include somebody that, that lost their job more recently at SVA. There, there was finally enough of, uh, a crowdsourced, carefully, meticulously documented, um, collective testimony along the lines of the Warren Ellis web, web website we've been talking about that was enough to overcome years of what seemed to be inaction and ineffectiveness by Title IX departments, by human resources departments that that were able to push things forward, actions forward that should have happened in 2016 or 2017. And I just, the longer I teach, and teaching is something I did not start doing until I'd been in the comics industry for a long time, the more convinced I'd become that that level is where we really need to uh, start uh, demanding fair treatment and proper treatment and training people to go out in the world and, and expect it as well. Like those students are looking to us to set examples. So I think these incidents are really important. And I want to go a little bit further and say there was also at the same time um, a uh, effort at SVA that is ongoing 
um, by the Black Students Union that launched an Instagram account called Black at SVA that has begun to speak out very powerfully about the marginalization of Black and POC uh, students at the school, the way in which they don't see their voices represented, the way in which they feel marginalized. Um, This has become a very powerful tool as well that is forcing the administration, not just the administration, but I would say, I think it's fair to say the faculty I'm on, to look at what we do and say, like, what are we doing wrong that they're having these experiences? How do we change this? Like, what what do we do differently about how we teach and about how we guide people? You know, the thing with racism in terms of this conversation is I still feel like there hasn't really been any sort of reckoning around it in the comic space at all. Um, like, it's just... You, I, I don't know. It feels like we, this, this, it's not a part of the, certainly like the intersection in which racism is impacting black women in comics, of whom there are so freaking few, it is mind boggling, who, of, you know, few women and who are allowed to like even freaking get work. Um, but like the, it feels like there hasn't really been a conversation around like the racism that black creators are experiencing directly as working in the industry. Um, and, or and maybe it is, and I'm just completely not seeing it. But like, I, I want to make sure that we're not leaving racism out of this conversation about abuse in the industry? I think part of it is because to, you know, systemically throughout America, but particularly in comic books, it's not seen as directly abusive because a lot of it is just passive, like not hiring somebody for something is passive because a lot of people don't get gigs. And I think that, you know, most of a comic solution when it comes to that is always stopped at diversity. And that means like, well, we hired a person of color to write this or draw this. And it's always like solved at a freelance level, but, you know, having worked in the industry, it's never about equity or inclusion, you know, having those voices in the room, having them direct, you know, the course of companies, the course of like books, the course of lines in any real and impactful way. And very often I, you know, in, in a, in a silo, like alone, <laughs> you know, it's not like, you know, there's, there's reputation across the board where it's like, you're, you're, you're not often the sole representation of like your gender race, you know, or, or what have you. So I, I think that's a large part of it, you know, and then you have these companies that don't, that have, that have been the way that they have been for so long that they don't even have the tools unless they're willing to acknowledge that, that, that they're, you know, oblivious to these things. So I think that's why a lot of it gets left out because on its face, you can just say like, oh, well, we hired this person, you know, to write this book for six issues that got canceled. Right. There's also a crazy level of defensiveness that is like, makes it so hard to have, I mean, sorry, defensiveness among white people that like makes it so hard to have anybody like listen to the feedback from folks who are trying to help them to be better people, you know? That's, I mean, I think that Um, that's a huge factor too in the stories that do and don't get seen. Like you were talking about, you know, Dark Horse, you know, the the assault and harassment issues and transphobia. Um, Something that came out not too long after, after Shauna Gore posted her, her account of, of, you know, assault by Scott Alley, um, Sean Wynn, who worked at Things for Another World, which is, is Dark Horse's sister retailer company for years, posted an absolutely wrenching thread um, on Twitter and elsewhere about the stuff he'd experienced working working as a manager at, at Things from Another World, including just including really like racism that's blatant in ways that we don't think of it being in the 20 teens if we are white and fairly insulated. And it got, you know, it got passed around some, and I saw a lot of it just because those were circles I was in, but it, it didn't get the visibility that I would have liked it to have. And I think, yeah, I think that white discomfort is a huge part of it. I mean, I think we read that stuff. It's, it's too, it's, it's, it's way, way, way too easy. And I think way too common a practice to see our, our good intent for, for our good intentions and our need to have those good intentions validated mean not amplifying the things that make it clear that those good intentions are failing 
massively. Well, I also, I was going to say, I also think it's because of the term racism. I know we all are running into this and now running into this more now across the board, but you know, nobody wants to feel like they've done something racist because everybody only understands racism in a very binary or like taboo racism way. You know, it's, you know, saying something racist, doing something like overtly racist, you know, it, it's, it's, it's being a member of the clan on the weekend, like it's stuff like that. And it's, like, it's a really difficult thing for people to understand that, you know, when you are in a structure, when you are in a system that is full of inherent racisms and like microaggressions and like systems that are built, you know, on inequality, you, you, you feel really put on your heels to find yourself culpable in those things, you know, and you can apply those things to sexism and all sorts of things. Like I've, you know, had those moments as well, which is like, ah, oh, I couldn't even conceive of that because that's not, you know, my perception within this system. So when you look at that in our industry, you have people who don't even understand like what racism really is aside from not calling me the N word to my face. Yeah. And, and people just don't look at somebody giving you the feedback about how to make, how to make something less sexist, how to make something less racist. Like if somebody's approaching you to give you feedback for it, that's like a gift. Like, I am glad that you're like helping me figure out how to handle this better or differently. It's not like, that's an opportunity. It's not rather than somebody saying, you know, this person is useless. I give up. Goodbye. Never look at me again. You know? Yeah. Like I very jokingly would like, you know, make fun of like miles morales on twitter and stuff like that because of his <laughs> hair that's just like there's no there's no afro latino black family that's letting that boy go outside the house with his head looking like that you know and it was it was lovely because like, i love that book but it took until the current creative team to actually like address it in a way that wasn't just me like saying like oh this is like racism or whatever it's like here you don't have a perspective on something and you're trying to reflect the culture you know and, and mm -hmm. there, there's there's something here that's missing and I'm not and yes, I'm saying it and making fun of you a little bit, but I'm also kind of being serious. <laughs> you, know, it's right. like, you want this character to be this person, then you need to reflect who he would be in the society you're trying to, you know, relay. And saying that your child is that race is not the same thing as being that yourself. I also want to say that, you know, there is no substitute for addressing these issues, not just by bringing in creators of color, but by hiring um, editors and administrators and, uh, uh, you know, managing editors, uh, content officers into top positions who are hired there because they need to be there and not just because they're being being brought in as window dressing, not just because they're being brought in to clean up the mess, because that's another thing we see too, right? And this is something that I used to see all the time in my early career in the comics industry, where number one, I was often the only woman in the editorial meeting. I was often the only queer person in the editorial meeting in the 90s. And I had to be the queer voice and I had to be the female voice. And when I had any opportunities, they were simply to work on the woman title or work on the kid's book or just like work on something that you were lame or, you know, spearhead this title that will make everybody else forget about that other thing. And I am seeing some of that now where on the one hand, you know, more um, uh, people are, POC people are being hired into positions of power, but it's often to clean up a mess and it shouldn't be like that. They should just be organically hired into there in the first place because they're the best person Thank for you. the job. Yeah. There's, there's so, a term for it in business. I don't remember what it is. It's the, the, our business is fucked and the last CEO, I'm sorry, am I allowed to say fucked on this podcast? Yeah. yeah please okay. say fucked that, so much. That, I will repeat it then. Yeah. Our business is fucked. Our last CEO drove it into the ground. Let's hire, let's, let's, you know, as a show of we're doing something different, good faith, hire, you know, someone from a marginalized population or multiple ones who will now inherit this mess and be here for two years and either burn out or end up kicked out because of the problems they inherited. Like it's, yeah, it's such a yeah. set thing. I, I, what, what Joan said, like, I can't emphasize enough specifically putting people from marginalized populations 
in positions where they have significant hiring power and where other people are accountable to them. Because people, I think, tend to see editors as the people in power, and especially at smaller publishers. Like, editors have the power to introduce talent, but they don't have veto power, especially, you know, low to mid-rank editors. You know, any, anyone who is not absolute, you know, VP level doesn't really have the power to say, no, we shouldn't be working with that person, doesn't really have the power to say, we absolutely need to do this, and is probably going to be pretty much living hand to mouth. And so, so, so putting people, so yeah. putting people, you know, cultivating careers to the point where people can advance to positions of power, but also just hiring people in at positions of, of, of significant curatorial and, and directional power and giving them the means to enforce it is is critical. You can't just say, okay, we're going to hire women and they're all going to be 20 and they're all going to be assistants. That doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. yeah, that is so right. Because that has been the solution for like the last 15 years. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Of quote unquote progress, you know? All the staff is like a handful of older white men and then younger um, people of color and women until they get completely fried and get replaced by the next class of tributes to be slaughtered upon the altar, basically. And the same ones, you know, generally, because I mean, like, yeah, comics is small and stuff like that. But in terms of like, you know, a rotation of new ideas and new blood, like, you know, I've had the, the, the privilege but also disappointment of working with people i literally grew up reading <laughs> like, you're still here. like you know it's like nothing it, nothing can change if, ever, if it's always the same you know well and well, bearing in mind high- and bearing in mind too that longevity doesn't necessarily mean quality that's that's sort of mm-hmm. that that's kind of a that that sounds meaner than it is but basically that the people who thrive in a vastly inequitable industry, who really thrive and persist and end up in positions of power in it, are very often either people who aren't in- impacted by the inequity to the point that they don't perceive it, or people who take an active hand in perpetuating it. That's like a t-shirt. Thank you. It would be a um, really long, awkward T-shirt. About, Bad design. Yeah, well, I would, I'd wear it. I'd wear it, and I would have like Cyclops cross fists on it. It would be, it would be a thing. Um, so you know, like the thing, the thing about like how, making sure that we actually have people in positions of power who will understand these things and represent different perspectives and will act differently is, you know, challenging for somebody like me, for example, who is like doesn't you know work in the comics industry, and so I feel like I have feel I do think that like fans are starting to realize what you describe, and we were, we don't really know what to do about it because it's not like, you know, you, I can go and like buy content, you know, like, like comics from diverse creators, but it's harder to figure out how to impact the editorial like decisions in a, in more of a staffing way. I don't know. I don't know, but I want to speak about HR real briefly, at least. Um, I know that some of the smallest comics publishers don't really have an HR staff or policies, um, but even with the larger ones, uh, so much of their, so much of the folks working on their comics are freelance and the HR isn't really set up to address the fact that they have this huge permalance, uh, population creating their work. Um, and so I've definitely been seeing, you know, calls to address some of these problems through HR, uh, but by the same token, like as you know, as a, as a, as, a, as a unionist, like I know that HR as a discipline was literally invented for the purpose of keeping workers from unionizing. Now I don't think that the HR people are in, mean mean badly or anything like that. In like every single case, Lord only knows. But like I, I don't know. I think the question of how do you make HR work for workers and yes, artists and editors and all of you guys are workers. Um, and also, like, do you feel like pushing for changes with HR are, is, a, is, is a significant demand or something we should be really spending much time thinking about and working on? I mean, I will say that HR departments, wherever they are, are charged, whether we like it or not, nine times out of 10 with the primary focus of protecting the company. Yes, also building 
human capital, but first and foremost, protecting the company. So this is a conversation about, you know, pressing them to go back to the original definition of human resources and talking about building and supporting human capital. Um, And it's also about creating more awareness around what the obligations actually are. I mean, um, uh, Ilana, I I think that you and I have had conversations about the fact that um, comics companies, editors at comics companies actually are to a certain degree liable for the actions they take with freelancers through their HR departments. They are responsible for them to a certain degree as independent, as independent contractors. There is, I think, a level of uh, liability that they have if they don't treat their talent properly. That's no substitute for a union, but there could at least be a higher level of awareness around that, that their actions with freelancers um, in a lot of states can be as you know litigious if they harass or abuse somebody as if they did it to somebody on their staff. And maybe there just needs to be a larger awareness of that. There absolutely needs to be larger awareness of that. I mean, people, employees don't even know that they can go to HR or what constitutes harassment within that, within, you know, a company that's having, having more widespread awareness and understanding of that is sort of the other side of the code of conduct, right? Because it's not just what it, it doesn't just tell people what not to do. It tells people what they've been subject to that's across lines. With the Eddie Bergesa situation, you know, where he was a high up person in D.C. editorial and was like harassing women to the point where D.C. was like not even going to hire any women who might have to work vaguely around him lest he harass them. Like, I mean, people approached H.R. and H.R. was just like, we don't care. And they just refused to, to do anything. You know, like that was. Um, it's so funny. Like you bring that up when you talk about human resources being about like like human equity and building, you know, up employees and stuff like that. And I can only speak from, well, I can speak from, from a lot of places, but just from like a personal place, like how demoralizing that is. I mean, we won't even talk about the victims. Like that's, that, that's obviously like the problem, but it's like, what does that tell everybody who works at a company when something like that is known and keeps happening and nothing is done about it? What does that tell you about the place that you work you it's know, a, and your value there? It's such a clear statement of priority. The other thing to know about HR is that they don't actually have the power to act, as far as I know. They have the power to recommend. That's an issue at Dark Horse. It's a massive issue at Dark Horse um, because HR, which is usually one or two people, and, and I, can, I can speak to some yeah, allegedly anonymous source stuff here with qualifiers, but I can also speak to my own experiences as when I was an employee there. HR would go over things and standard policy and respond to people and then very frequently be aggressively overruled by upper management. And this was this was around harassment issues, but it was also around things like disability accommodations. Like it was a very weird stuff. And as far as I know, and, and this was this was an issue with with the healthcare benefits stuff too. Like H, that wasn't an HR decision. That was a decision that was firmly and exclusively in the hands of upper management. So what HR, you know, and, and the, the HR situation at, at DC around Berganza, I think, was very different because that was, that was a situation where HR, at least from what I could tell, seemed to be pretty actively blocking, blocking folks directly. But even a good HR department, even a well-meaning HR department, is only only has the power that it's granted. Right. Although you will sometimes never know that to hear the way it's discussed. If you go and look at these incidents of people finally um, being taken out at private companies, um, at schools, uh, wherever after there were many, many instances of abuse over years, administration will point at HR and say, well, go talk to HR and HR will uh, give the guidance and say, you should really go talk to administration. They would just keep pointing at each other, right? Right. And that is a bad dynamic. And we are in what I hope is the twilight year of a particularly bad 
federal government that has been contributing to that over the last year or so, especially recently this year with the dismantling of Title IX and our education secretary giving more power to uh, perpetrators of, of sexual abuse in campus situations, that administration has to get out of office, right? And, and those, are, those are really higher level machinations that have to take place. So this, in a way, goes back to the start of this conversation where we were talking about, you know, the whole spectrum of things you can do. Yes, you can get, uh, you can get more awareness around HR departments, you can demand more action from an HR department, but you can also, you know, create a culture that just goes right past them, that just forces them to act, that just, that just makes certain things unacceptable that 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 just just makes it strange that there would have ever been this thing in place for so many years where women were hired and and then like not left in the same room with an editor like nobody coming in the industry anymore should think that's acceptable we all did back in the day we all did but the culture has to change so that nobody thinks that would ever be an acceptable way to go about it so I know we're we're running we're running close on time. I and I have two questions that I do want to get if folks are okay with with doing that. Um, but uh, one of one of the for folks who don't work in the industry, like one of the sort of immediate gut responses we have to when we hear about terrible stuff happening in the industry is like we want to, to boycott something. Certainly, when there's like a publisher where you can see that like the publisher is a party to this in a clear way rather than there being maybe just like a particular person who's a jerk, people are always, you know, like, okay, well, I'm going to boycott this or I'm going to boycott that. And I, I have my own thoughts about these as strategies, but I'd love to hear what other folks think about, and you, you don't have to be specific, Lord knows, but like, what do you think about the fan responses about like, well, we want to boycott this publisher or we want to boycott this particular like creator. Like, do what you a- think that, Timely question <laughs> for me, I guess. <laughs> and like as someone who I suppose you would consider recent events like a boycott, but I think really what it is is what we're what we've been talking about is holding companies and individuals accountable and letting them know that there is, you know, a a larger group of people who disapprove of, you know, behaviors, tactics, and policies in a real and impactful way. You know, so I don't know that it always warrants a boycott like that, you know, usually as a result of a company not hearing that people have a problem with something, you know? So it's sort of like, hey, here's an issue that we think that you have and you need to resolve it. Oh, you're going to ignore us? Okay, well, now we're going to have to impact your wallet, you know? Sorry. I think I I just realized I was muted. I think... We need to learn what a boycott is popularly. I, I mean, people use the term boycott to mean I do not buy things by this person or by this company, which is, you know, works as an individual statement, but isn't an organized boycott in the ways that tend to make an impact. A boycott needs to be large scale, it needs to be organized, and it needs to have specific goals. Um, it's a public pressure, cam- it's, a fina- it's a public and financial pressure campaign. And it's got to be organized. Um, so there's that. I, I mean, I think, yeah, I think when, when people in positions of power, you know, presidents of companies, C-suites of companies are the ones with the power to, if they feel like it, make things a lot better, they need to be made to feel like it. And if goodwill can't do it, financial pressure can. I think it's a really powerful tool. The flip side of that, and, and the other thing is that I think I think fans... I, I think there needs to be more understanding that you don't just boycott something when it's convenient, that it is, it is a sustained action. Um, like, and that it's, it's got to involve things like prioritizing creators over characters, but. Oh God, where was I going with this? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that, um, that, but yeah, know, I think, I think, I think it's gotta be, I think they've, they've, those, those actions, if they're taken have to be more widespread, they have to be, 
more significant and they've got to have, they've got to have more, more concrete goals and, and more organization to actually have impact. I think, you know, making individual consumer choices is great and it's important. And I mean, there are, there are tons of places where I draw personal lines, but wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. advocate for or organize a more public boycott. Um, and I think those, but, but I think, I think it's really important to learn to differentiate between those. Thank you. And I just, yeah, like calling something a boycott that isn't is not really helping anyone because if a company sees that like, oh, they've called this boycott, but it's not actually having a financial impact that doesn't exactly make the case look very strong. You know, it, it, people would be better off having like a group petition or something where you can show numbers versus expecting people to like suddenly say, oh, wait, no, all the sales have completely fallen off. It can be a lot easier to I mean, it's a lot of work to do a boycott. Well, you've, it's, it's, and yeah. you've got to find the things that they the the places that will impact them like the thing that made the difference at dark horse wasn't like the public pressure campaign helped a lot the thing that ultimately resulted in a policy change was a privately organized petition involving a lot of high profile comics creators and professionals with wider media reach yeah. which yeah was scheduled like dark horse changed its policy Officially, they made the statement I like about half a day before it was scheduled to be released, and with language that, that made it very clear that they'd seen it. Yeah, and I, so sorry. figuring out who has the power to exact to exert pressure in a significant way and focusing on them rather than ne even necessarily the final goal is yet yeah, strategy is so 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 critical in making this stuff work. Yeah, I, I really agree 100% with Jay there. It, it has to be a curated action, right? Like you learn by doing. Some boycotts work, some don't. Some campaigns work, some don't. You'll never learn if you don't try and if you don't try to hit as directly as possible. I think there's been some efforts that haven't worked because they wound up, say, inadvertently hurting retailers while trying to make a point with a publisher. Um, when that happens, you just go back and you say, okay, well, how do we involve the retailer in such a way where we don't just hurt them by not buying their product, but we buy other product instead, which incentivize them to order less from the publisher. You know, you just like, you just like find, find a way to balance it out and, and like, call it what you want, call it a boycott, call it uh, a campaign, call it a cancel. I don't personally have a lot of patience for people who cry and whine about cancel culture because I'm like, you know, people who get canceled are simply being spoken out against. Like they actually already still have a lot of power. <laughs> it's not actually like their endeavor got canceled. It's just a word. It just means that people are speaking out against what's wrong. Like they're not actually being eradicated. It's not a zero sum situation. People are taking action. Just deal with it. Yeah. Freedom of speech is not entitlement to an audience. Yeah. No. Well, um, my, my own, my, my, my final question for folks is, do you think that when it comes to the big two of DC and Marvel, do you think that the parent companies have a role to play in terms of like people trying to readers trying to exert pressure on them or like, how much involvement or awareness do, you, do folks think they even have about what is happening? Good question. I mean, that's, a very, that's a very good point because these, the, with the big two, we have to keep in mind that they are now content generators for major, major media corporations. And they are pretty subservient to those corporations. You know, so you are actually dealing with a much bigger problem now with the big two than you ever did. Um, if DC or Marvel is doing something wrong, because they're essentially a subsidiary at this point, I would say it's still important to message up above them. And, and, and that's the other thing, like I, I make extra sure to make sure all my students understand that DC Comics is a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, that Marvel is a subsidiary of Disney understand who you're actually dealing with um like be prepared to punch higher and remember that dc and marvel are not the only game in town these days there are still you know there are now a lot of other publishers like marvel i'm sorry idw and and 
Dark Horse and Aftershock and all boom, all these other places out here that are more accountable, but are hoping to, to, to achieve that level of relevance. So we have to keep them honest as well. So you appeal above, you know, to the owners of the big guys and you appeal directly to the mid tier that is becoming more powerful now, if that makes sense. I don't know if it does. Boy, we, we have to do a whole episode about dynamite sometime, which I am not prepared to do quite yet. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, yeah, on that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll bring you back for that. Thank you, Kwanzaa. Um, good, because I wasn't kidding. I, good. I'm, I, I'm very glad. This will, this will, so uh, does, does anybody have anything you want to say before we wrap? Anyone? I think the most powerful thing that we can be doing, or actually, actually, oh, I have two things. The first of which is that we touched on this at the very beginning, but I want to emphasize again that harassment and especially chronic harassment and and abuse don't exist in vacuums. And in an industry like comics, especially where people tend to come in very young and that tend to be very insular, there is no good way to address those proactively without addressing the culture and the factors that promote them. So absolutely keep talking about individual cases, call out individual cases, but always look at them as symptomatic too. And look at the larger places where shifts where shifts can can have ripple effects um, and trickle down. And the other thing is just keep having conversations loudly. The difference that Me Too has made, and before that, the the difference that social media and just the internet have made in both the visibility of these conversations and the capacity to organize around them is phenomenal. Like the way the ways that we can connect and especially those of us who are are you know the only whatever at a publisher the only you know whatever at a group or a meeting can connect with other people like us can can be part of something that's a unit in a vocal block and not sole representatives now um is is unprecedented and it's amazing and it's powerful and we got to keep using it thank you yeah and, and that's one of the reasons why I think you see some folks pulling out of it is they don't, they don't want to be held accountable in spaces that they can't control. Um, although certainly publishers should have ways of making sure that their people working for them don't harass other people over social media. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And, um, you know, I know one of the things I'm really excited about is uh, on J.M. Mouse Explain the X-Men, you'll have an episode coming up real soon, I believe, August 2nd, um, that is direct relation to some of this conversation, Jay. Can you give us a quick rundown? Yeah, so we talk about this stuff pretty regularly on the show because part of explaining the X-Men as as we use it is discussing its larger social and 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 comics industry and cultural and political context. Um, But we are very specifically chronologically about to enter an era in the 90s when the two primary writers on the X-Line are creators who's who who have been repeatedly and chronically incredibly and in some cases publicly documentedly um accused of a lot of harassment and abuse uh, one is, is Warren Ellis the other is Scott Lobdell and we know that we have a listener because of what we do and because our listener base like we know that we drive business um like we've we've looked at at correlations to things like things like sales and downloads and the ethics of discussing those works as critics and consuming them as readers and recommending them and especially when they're works that were were you know meaningful or formative to us are really complicated and are i think largely just open ended and so we feel like before we we really get into covering that material we need to sit down and talk about what covering it means so miles and i are going to discuss that and i'm really really excited we're going to be um joined by by Laura Hudson who is is a writer and editor and who was who was actually my editor at Wired for years and is someone else who's who's done a lot of writing and speaking about this stuff and just just less less to come up with a clear code of what it means than just to kind of ask a lot of difficult questions and challenge each other to pick them apart. I'm so excited for it. Kwanzaa, 
Where can our listeners find your work online and in the comic book stores, of course? Um, yes, you can find us in comic book stores. You can find uh, me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at, at Kwanzer. You can also find more information about my book, Black, at blackthecomic.com. If you're interested in my humanoid stuff, that's h1comics.com. And if you're just interested in me, uh, kwanzaosagifo.com. And I don't expect you to spell it, but you can Google it and I'll probably pop up. <laughs> and that's Kwanzaa with an R at the end for the Twitter and Instagram accounts. Yeah. I have truly enjoyed your Twitter feed of late, as per usual. And Joan, uh, where can our folks keep up with your work? Yeah, people can find me at joanhilty.com. I am on Twitter, but I don't, I just don't engage with it much. I, I can't. It's okay. <laughs> so it's okay. Instagram is better for me, joan.hilty. Um, I will be uh, probably moderating some panels with the um, uh, lineups that I'm organizing for both Brooklyn Book Festival uh, this coming um, fall, uh, which is about to announce a very exciting lineup. It will all be very COVID friendly. Don't worry, but more importantly, excitingly <laughs> divor- div- diverse at the end of this month. So, um, you can find out mostly by following me on Instagram at joan.hilty. And of course, Jay most famously is at, at not lasers on Twitter. And I, of course, am at Ilana underscore Brooklyn on Twitter a little bit too much. Graphic policies, graphicpolicy.com. Um, you know, we have had, had a lot of journalism over the years about sexual harassment and abuse in the comics industry. And I encourage you to check out the coverage that we've ran before. Um, so I want to thank our guests for joining me. This is a complicated topic and there's a lot of different perspectives that I wish we could have in the show in this time that like they're just you can't even have just one episode with so I know we'll be, that I will be revisiting these conversations again in the future you know I look forward to having more folks on joining me um, and uh, and so yeah so thank you for listening to this episode and as we like to say keep it geeky Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos. Or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.